Thank you. What a, what a pleasure to be here. What a great topic, the end of school. Yay. Uh, <laughs> I'm, a, uh, I'm an evolutionary psychologist, and what that means is that I'm interested in human nature. I'm interested in how that nature came about by biological evolution, by natural selection. I'm particularly interested in the nature of human children, and most particularly, in that aspect, those aspects of children's nature that lead them to become educated. So the big idea that I'm here to talk about is this, that children are biologically designed to educate themselves. They do it joyfully through play, questioning, and exploration. We don't need to educate children. All we need to do is to provide the conditions that would allow them to educate themselves. The basic instincts of childhood, their playfulness, their curiosity, their willfulness, their sociability, have been honed by natural selection to serve the function of education. But we take those abilities away when we put them in school and prevent them from educating themselves. My argument is that we, if we provide the conditions that children need to educate themselves, we really can do away with schools as we know them. Now, some of you, some of you might be thinking that I'm crazy. Some of you, more kindly, might be thinking that I'm a hopeless idealist. But I assure you, I am neither. I'm a hard-headed realist. I've done a great deal of research on this topic. The idea that I'm talking about today is supported by a great deal of empirical observation and research, which is elaborated upon in my book, but which here I have just a few minutes to try to convince you is worth uh, thinking about. The first way I want to think about this idea is by looking at hunter-gatherer cultures. Now, we were all hunter-gatherers until relatively recently in history from a biological point of view. Some people in certain isolated parts of the world have survived as hunter-gatherers into modern times, and anthropologists have found them and studied their cultures. A few years ago, a graduate student of mine and I conducted a survey of 10 different anthropologists who had studied seven different hunter-gatherer cultures among them on three different continents. We asked them questions about how children became educated in that culture. One of our questions was, how much time do children in the culture that you observed have to play and explore on their own? And the answer that we got from every single one of these anthropologists was all the time. The children and even the teenagers are free to play and explore in age-mixed groups away from adults all day long, every day, and in the process, they become educated. Another question we asked was, how do they play? What are the forms of their play? And what we found from that, from, from these uh, anthropologists, was that they play at the very activities that are hardest to learn and are most important to learn for success in their culture. So they play at hunting and gathering and finding roots and digging them up. They play at building things like huts and dugout canoes and bows and arrows and musical instruments. They play at the music and dance and art of their culture. They play at those things that they have to learn to become educated. The anthropologists also told us, and I've seen it in writing many times, that they have never seen brighter, happier, more resilient, more self-reliant children than the hunter-gatherer children that they observe. So the question is, could this work in our culture? At first gloss, you might think, of course it can't. <laughs> you know, we're not hunter-gatherers. There are things that we have to learn that hunter-gatherer children don't have to learn, like reading, writing, and arithmetic. And moreover, it's not so easy for children in our culture to be exposed naturally to all the skills and, and knowledge that's important to the culture. So I might think that it wouldn't work except for the fact that for many years now I've been an observer 
and researcher at the Sudbury Valley School in Framingham, Massachusetts. This school was founded in 1968, so it's now been in existence for almost half a century. It has about 150 students at any given time, age four on through about 18. It has uh, about eight staff members, adult staff members. It operates on a budget that's about half of what the local public schools cost. And it accepts essentially all students who apply. There's, so this is not elite education. This is eminently affordable. Now, the unique things about this school are the way it is administered and the educational philosophy of the school. The school is, is, operates as a, uh, as a participatory democracy. All of the school rules are made by a school meeting at which each student and each staff member has one vote, and the rules are enforced at a judicial committee by a judicial committee which is modeled after the jury system of our larger culture. At any given time, there's one little kid, one middle-sized kid, a couple of teenagers, and one staff member on the judicial committee, and if somebody, whether it's a staff member or a student, violates a rule at the school, they're brought up before the judicial committee, which makes a decision about guilt or innocence and a decision about uh, what the punishment might be if, if found guilty. So that's the way the school operates. In terms of the educational philosophy, it's essentially the same as that of a hunter-gatherer band. The school offers no curriculum, no tests, no grades, no substitutes for grades. It expects children to decide themselves what they want to learn, how they want to learn, what they want to do. If you were to go through the school at any given time of day, you might see scenes such as on this slide. You would see children in the art room making, making various kinds of art projects. You'd, you might find somebody cooking in the kitchen. You would always find some people in the computer lab. You might find somebody in the photo lab. You might find children building with blocks in the children's playroom. Children playing music in one of the music practice rooms. Outdoors, you uh, might find people playing down by the brook or climbing boulders or fishing in the pond or playing a game on the athletic field or strumming a guitar and talking and singing. In the winter, you might find people building a snowman or skating on that pond that they fish. Key to learning at this school is age mixing. The children are not segregated by age. The older children are naturally drawn to the little kids and the little kids are naturally drawn to the big kids. The little children observe what the older ones can do, and they want to do that. They want to be able to read if they see older ones read. They want to be able to climb trees if they see older ones climb trees. They also learn by interacting with the older ones. In age-mixed games, the older children are constantly scaffolding the behavior of the younger ones, bringing them up to higher levels of performance. So, for example, many children at this school learn to read because they play games that involve reading with kids who know how to read. And the kids who know how to read more or less teach them to read, not because they're trying to teach them to read, but because they almost need to do so to play the game. The advantage of age mixing also goes the other way. The older children are learning to care and be nurturant to be leaders by helping the younger ones in this setting. And they're also being continuously inspired by the creativity and the energy of the younger ones. So the age mixing is, at, is as valuable for the older kids as for the younger ones. The best evidence that this school works comes from follow-up studies for the graduates. Quite a number of years ago, I, along with a colleague, David Chanoff, conducted one such study we found essentially all of the people who had graduated from that school, almost all of them agreed to be in the study. And what we found was that they were doing very well out there in the world. They, were, they had no problems in higher education if they chose to go that way. And they were in a wide variety of careers. They were essentially all of them very satisfied with their lives. The Sudbury model is replicable. More than three dozen schools modeled after it exists, mostly in this country, some in other countries. 
Um, <clears throat> that one of the closest to, to here is the, in fact, the closest to here is the Tallgrass Sudbury School in, uh, in Riverside, Illinois. Now here I want to describe the conditions that I think are common to a hunter-gatherer band and the Sudbury Valley School and that really are the conditions that optimize children's abilities to educate themselves. Six, immersion in a stable, moral, democratic community. Both a hunter-gatherer band and the Sudbury Valley School are in their own different ways, democratic communities. They're communities in which every child knows that their ideas and their actions influence the others involved in the community. So they're growing up in a setting where they feel responsible not just for themselves, but for the community within which they are developing. And that is an extraordinarily important aspect of education and one which is almost completely ignored in our regular schools. Now what I want you to notice is that none of these conditions exist in our standard schools, none of them. It's as if we deliberately take away from children everything that they need to educate themselves when we put them in school. And then we try very inefficiently and very ineffectively to educate them. So I'm going to conclude this way. I'm absolutely sure that someday people are going to look back at us now and they're going to say, what were those people thinking? Why on earth did they ever believe that coercion is essential for education? That's like believing you have to force people to eat or you have to force people to breathe. Why on earth did they ever think that standardization such that people, regardless of their interests, regardless of their predilections, should all learn the same thing in the same way, be tested by the same test. What kind of a crazy idea is that? I'm sure that we will reach the day where people will look back and say that. I hope we reach that day sooner rather than later. I would like to see it come in my lifetime. And I hope that some of you, maybe really all of you, I hope, will play a role in bringing that time about before too long. 